Um, but today is a lot about who God is to you and who you are, your identity in Christ and, and what that might mean and how you can apply that. So if it's your first time here and your first time to this series, that's okay. You don't have to have been here before. And if it's your last one here or your only one, that's good too. You're going to get something out of it. But I, instead of starting in chapter 4, i got to jump back up to the last verse of chapter 3. So being Galatians 3, and then 4, and then one other verse somewhere else. But that's it. We'll be mostly right here. All right. So Galatians 3, 29. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. So here... Paul says to the church in Galatia, right? If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Now, who he was talking to, the church in Galatia, wasn't necessarily a lot of Jewish people that understood who Abraham was, um, but they were certainly taught who he was and taught about this idea of if you are Christ, right? And so what he tried to tell them all along was that if you accepted Christ, whatever that might look like for you, if you went through the things to accept Christ, to make him your savior, you are his. You are now an heir. You are part of that promise that was made to Abraham that the Messiah was coming and there'd be this mighty nation and that everything technically in the end is going to work out. Does everybody feel like it's working out right now? Yeah, some of you, some of you, yeah, some of you know. Yeah, I'm on the no, all right? Just be honest. It doesn't feel like it's working out for me right this second, but I know it will. Like, I know it has, and I see it, and I claim that victory because I'm an heir to the throne as well, right? And so here we see Paul reminding them. Now, all this happened, right? And uh, what he wanted them to understand is, I want you to remember that you are a Christian, you accepted Christ. You did that. Paul came to the Galatian area to the, and started that church there, and he shared with them the good news, right? Like, hey, do you want to be a Christian? Do you want to know more about Jesus? Let me tell you about this guy who will set you free from whatever you're doing. I tried to catch part of one of the songs, that second song. It, it said you were a beggar, now you're royalty. And the next one, I can't remember what it said. Do you remember? Prisoner, now you're free. That's great because that's exactly what we're talking about in here. You're going to see the idea of slave slash prisoner and all that. But, but he wanted them to understand and remember, you are a Christian. Now, this made me think about the fact that I know, I mean, I've been in the church world for a long time. Not as long as some of you, right? Oh, McCarthy was there when they rolled the stone away. Uh, <laughs> but in my... 31 years of ministry, here is what I have learned. Everyone that tells me they're a Christian is not necessarily a Christian. Do you guys understand that? Have you ever met someone? Now, now listen, I can't tell you if you're a Christian or not. I can't meet you and go, mm. <laughs> People say, oh, you can judge them by their fruit. Really, you can't, because I, I mean, I don't know. None of us are perfect. We're all sinners and hot messes, and so I, I can't really tell you if you're a Christian or not a Christian. I can tell you how to become a Christian. But I do know that in my ministry, in my 31 years plus now uh, of being a pastor and being around Christians, I've encountered people who at least doesn't feel like they're a Christian. And then I talk to them and I find out, no, they're not a Christian. They're not. And I know that because when I ask them, how do they know they're a Christian? They tell me things like, uh, well, yeah, I'm a Christian. I've gone to church my whole life. I'm a Christian, my, my, my dad or my grandfather's a pastor, right? So yeah, I'm a, I'm a Christian. And, and I hear them say things like that and say, oh, I know I am. My grandma drags me to church and my grandma's like this amazing Christian, so I am too. And so people do have, and it's not just a handful, a lot of people have this idea in their head that they're a Christian by default. Maybe they were born a Christian because their parents were or their grandparents were. Maybe they're a Christian by association, right? They go to church with their family or whatever else. I want you to understand this. The line to salvation is a single file line. There are, it's not a team thing here. You're not getting in because of someone else with you. The only way in, Jesus says that I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no one may come to the Father but through me. Okay, everybody understand that? And so I'm not here to make anyone question their salvation, but I want us all to be on the same page here. That when you became a Christian, it was something you did. 
because you accepted Christ. Remember, the Bible says if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It does not say, and if your grandma is a great Christian, and if your dad is next to you telling you to be a great Christian or, or whatever else, what's the old joke? Being at McDonald's doesn't make you a chicken nugget. Being in church doesn't make you a Christian. Yeah, stuff like that. You heard that one before? I don't know. I like it. Yeah. Don't, you're a chicken nugget. Yeah, you are. Who doesn't like nuggies? Everybody loves nuggies. All right. Well, anyways, the basis that Paul taught them, the basis of our faith as Christians is that there is a sin problem that we all have, every one of us. Remember, the Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Picture the most holy person you can think of, right? Maybe it is a grandma. Maybe it's Oma Kathy. She was there, right? Maybe it's your, your Oma or your Opa, or maybe it's this person you know. And like, man, they are the most holy person I've ever could imagine being around. Like when I was growing up, if someone told me to think of the most holy person, I pictured Billy Graham. I didn't know him personally. I didn't know anything about him. I just watched him preach on TV, and that's all I knew that, man, that guy's a heck of a preacher. That's, that's all I had. But did you know that him, whoever you're picturing, when you think of the most holy person you know, are still sinners? Did you know Oma Kathy's a sinner? Yeah, I know because she's a longhorn. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. But, but we, she's still a sinner. Billy Graham was still a sinner. Whoever you hold in that, that esteem, that they, man, they are super Christian. They are also a super sinner because there is a sin problem in the world. And the only answer to the sin problem isn't me and you trying to do something and get over it and up, you know, pick ourselves up our bootstraps and I'm going to overcome this sin. We can't. It is Christ. Christ's death was enough It was all that it could handle. It's the only thing that's worthy to do this. And by him doing that, we became heirs. And so I want you to think about who you are. Right? It said in verse 29, And if you are in Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. You are an heir to the throne of Christ. Now, jump into chapter 4. I mean, and I just did all that to get us on the same page, right? Christian. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything, but he is under the guardian and managers until the date set by the father. He's saying, hey, remember your heirs, and I want you to understand that you're like children and slaves, and that's weird, right, if you read that. There's a whole lot of weirdness when you talk about slaves in the Bible. There's some that would argue slavery was different in the biblical times. I would argue, I don't know. <laughs> I think it probably was worse. Uh, and obviously American slavery and what we picture in our history, it was like that some and some it wasn't. I know some that like to paint a picture that, oh, slavery in the biblical times was much more like, hey, you really liked working for this guy. And so you just stayed on and, and you know, you earned your freedom because you were a slave because you couldn't pay your bills. Can you imagine that now? Imagine if you couldn't pay your credit card or your car payment, and so the, you know, the, they arrested you and said, no, nope, now you're going to be a slave until you have it all paid off. Well, that's what happened. And then they would allude, people have said in his, throughout history, oh, and then they liked it so much there, they just stayed. They just, they volunteered to be slaves. And while that is true, people did do that, that's not what all slavery was like. Ultimately, the idea of slavery, when it talks about, at least in this part, when Paul's talking about it, everyone knew what a slave was. He was talking about how they didn't have any rights, right? They were under the control of someone else. And so he even says children, right? You're an heir, but you're still a child. Did you know that in biblical times, children, man, they, they really weren't highly regarded. <laughs> I, I don't know if you know this. Like, we would do anything for our kids. I know a lot of you teenagers and kids might not think your parents will do anything for you, but they do. We lived in Houston when my children were born. And I tell you what, you lived in a neighborhood based on the school. in in Houston, any big city, right? You you didn't live in inner city Houston because you didn't want your kids going to inner city Houston schools. Austin's the same way, any big city like that, right? People move to other towns for the school districts, for the anonymities for their kids. Parents will pay thousands of dollars for their kids to have private lessons in 
you name the activity, tennis, baseball, competitive cup stacking, I don't know. And they'll travel them all over the world and do these things because we do so much for our kids. But I need you to understand that in the biblical times, that was not the case most of the time. I mean, if a child was born and it had anything wrong with it, it's very normal for a child to be thrown in the garbage, which is, you hear that and you're like, no. Oh, yeah, that's what they did. It, if, I mean, even when they got older, right, you, you read the Old Testament, you can see in there if a child starts back talking, they can say, you know what? No, I'm going to take them out to the city gates. I'm just going to stone them. I don't need them anymore. That was the mentality. Christ, I mean, uh, children did not have rights to protect them. There was no such thing. You could sell your kids if you wanted to. I mean, yeah. Now, some of your parents are thinking, okay, I could sell some kids. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the point being is he describes it here. They were kids. You're like a child that you have no say in things right? You're an heir. Man, that's a big deal. But you don't really have a say in those things because you're a child. Yeah, you're an heir to the throne, the heir to the kingdom, but you're a kid right now, so you don't have any rights. You don't get any of that stuff right now, is what he is saying. And, and as he implies that to them and helps them understand that, what he wants them to really see, because we're showing you who God is and who you are, is he's trying to show them God is your father. Now, at this time, in the biblical time that Paul's writing, you, a child's life, quality of life, was 100% based on the father. Doesn't mean that all fathers threw out a kid in the trash or sold him into slavery, but it was allowed and it was normal. Were there fathers during this time that loved all their children regardless what was wrong with them or right with them? Absolutely. Were there fathers that would refuse to sell their kids into slavery even though they drove them nuts? I know, I know there were. There were great dads during this time. And so what he's trying to get you to understand is it's based on the character of your father. Now, I don't want you to raise your hands, but has anybody ever experienced a bad father? I mean, don't, no, don't raise your hands. Some of you put hands up. I told you don't do it. Some of your fathers are in here, so, you know. But I understand fathers aren't created equal, are they? They're not. Some, some dads are amazing. I've met some fathers over the years, and I'm like, man, you're the model dad. I wish I could be like you one day, or I wish you were my dad, and that kind of stuff. And, and I'll be honest, growing up, I didn't have a great dad, and some of you didn't have great dads growing up. And to me, that's kind of a big deal because what, what happened for me is when I went to this youth camp and this pastor started teaching, one of the things he said is, did you know there's a father who loves you? There's a father in heaven who's never going to forget about you. There's a father who no matter what will always remember the baseball practice or whatever else. There's a father that's never going to forget you. There's a father that loves you no matter what you do. He holds you in his arms. There's a father that cares for you so much. And when I heard that pastor start to explain God like that to me, guess what I did? Yes, please. I would like to know more. That's what happened when Paul went to Galatia. That's what happened when Paul went to these other places. He taught them freedom in the gospel, set free. And he taught them, you know how kids are, right? How we, man, man, I know how you could have been thrown away. You made it, luckily. But there's a father in heaven that's not like these earthly fathers. And people heard that message and went, yeah, I would like to know more as well. I want to know about a father who would not maybe just sell me to slavery. I want to know about a father that's going to be there for me, a father that's going to support me, a father that is like what I picture nowadays. We picture on TV. Back in the day, it was, you know, was it the Leave it to Beaver? Uh, those shows, Little House on the Prairie, you know, these amazing dads, and that's not the case so much anymore. And that wasn't reality anyways. But he wanted them to see this idea, and I saw that. That's what worked on me. And so all along, Paul's been teaching in, in this letter to, to be against false teachers, right? And so he came there, he taught him about God the Father, the gospel, his son Jesus, and how if you accepted him, you were set free from the old ways, right? That's what saved is. But then what happened is other people came, didn't they? And we've talked about it for weeks. Uh, they tried to add to Jesus. They said things like, hey, if you want to be a Christian, you also need to be circumcised. 
that's not a cool, I still can't imagine that going down. I couldn't fathom a church service where I said, all right, guys, guess what? <laughs> you really want to be a Christian? We're going to have some stuff in the back room. Uh, <laughs> I need you to get a line. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? But for whatever reason, they did. And when Paul wrote to them, he left people that were growing. He left people that, were, that understood what he taught them, and he taught them a lot. He didn't just leave them with, a, hey, choose Jesus, that's it. He, obviously, he taught them about end times. He taught about the Christ was coming back. He taught them about salvation and proper ways they should act and that kind of stuff. He was their pastor. He stayed there for a while. He didn't just like pop in for a weekend, good job, guys, and leave. And so he grew this church, he had this church there, he taught the people, and the people, when he left, were self-sufficient and were growing. They were maturing in their faith. They were maturing as Christians, right? They were learning to study things on their own. They didn't have the Bible like we had it, right? But they had what they learned in the Old Testament was brought to them. They had this idea, all the things that, that were taught by Paul. Imagine that. It was this new stuff that was crazy and exciting, exciting, and it spread like wildfire, right? That idea of a father and all these things. And so they had all that. And then people came in. Religious people came in. They're the ones that said the circumcision stuff. They're the ones that started teaching, you know, you need more than that. You need other stuff. You know what? You need some rules to help hold you accountable. You need to follow this and do that. And what actually happened is those believers who were growing, they were heirs to the throne. They were growing and maturing, not backslid, but they unmatured. Is that what it's called? I don't even know what the word would be. I'm an Aggie, sorry. That's a big, I don't even know that concept. They lost their maturity. They reverted back to their childhood, basically, because they had people there telling them, you need your hand held. You need to know these rules so you don't mess up. That freedom that, we talked, that he talked about, no, 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 you don't understand. That's not enough. And so they kept adding to it. And yes, what happened is those early Christians slipped backwards in their maturity, and they didn't do things on their own anymore. They needed someone to help them and hold their hand. Did anyone in here think that that's what Christ wanted to happen? Does anyone think that the idea was that churches would be places for a pastor to hold everybody's hands and walk them very carefully through the Bible? Now, let me explain it to you, okay? Now, Oma Kathy, again, she was there, was written, so I don't want to explain it to her. But everybody else, I got to be like, Chris, I'm going to tell you about Jesus now, okay? He, that is not the point. The point was to share this message of hope, to share this idea that you can be set free and it's Jesus only. There's no Jesus plus this, plus this, plus this. And you're supposed to take that and go with it. Like you're supposed to go, yep, I'm an heir to the throne. I'm gone. I'm going to tell people about this. I'm going to go out. I'm going to share this. I'm going to live this. Not, I'm just going to sit in a room and make sure everyone teaches me more things. I'm not ready for that yet. And I know you're, some of you are kind of drifting right now and saying, I don't know what all this means. Here's what I want you to see. Look at verses 3 through 5. In the same way, we also, when we were children, we were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. You know what that means? You had to do what your parents told you to do. You had to do that, right? But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoptions as sons. There's a lot here, and I'm not going to get through all of it because this could make up several weeks talking about some of these things. But as I've been talking to you, I've been trying to lay the groundwork for what you see here. He talks about when you were, uh, I don't know, a child, and you're under these laws, and all those things were there. You had to do what you were told, all that kind of stuff. He's talking about all that to paint this picture of what you should look like as a Christian, because he's talking to the Galatians who are messing up, right? And so best that I can see, the best that I can explain this is he's saying, are you a son or are you a slave? Right? There's a difference between being a son of God and a slave to God. Now, some of you might think, well, I don't know. Is that the same thing? I'm a slave to God. Isn't it cool to be a slave to God? Paul talks about that sometimes, too. In this context, though, he's trying to differentiate to these people. That there's one thing, being a son, that's who you're called to be, and being a slave. I want you to think about this. If you think Christianity is about you doing enough good things... 
If you think Christianity is about you following the rules and that you have to do this and this and this, and if you don't do that, man, then that's a slave. You're a slave to sin. You're a slave to trying to be good enough. You're a slave to this false picture that it's not just Jesus, that you need other things to do. You understand? If you're a son, you're not seeking approval. You're not trying to do enough so the master looks at you and says, okay, good job. You're you're not tiptoeing around trying not just to make God mad. That's slave mentality in this context. You are an heir to the throne, a son who's not seeking approval because you already have approval. For God so loved the world. He gave his one and only son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish. You can't make God approve you anymore. He approves of you so much that he sent his son. He loves you so much. And so what Paul is trying to get them to understand, guys, you had it. When I left, you were living as sons, as heirs to the kingdom. You weren't trying to do these things so that God would somehow like you more or win his approval. You were acting out of approval. Because God approves of you, because you're an heir to the throne, you're doing things because you love him. Not because you're afraid if you don't do them, then God's going to get you. And so if you have this false idea that, that you're acting as a slave to God, then you have a false picture of God to those people. And I met the people. I know there's people here that feel this way. That that God is watching you. He's just waiting for you to screw up. You know, God's following behind you, Ryan, and just waiting for you to mess up announcements. And when you do, wham, he's going to get you. He's just waiting for you to sin. And as soon as you sin, he's going to put his thumb down on you. That's not God, though. That's not what he says. That's not what Jesus came to do. Even in the garden, people thought that was God in the Garden of Eden walking, ready to put it on him. He didn't even do that, did he, in the garden? He even called out and said, where are you? Like he couldn't see the two naked people hiding in the bushes. God all along, and I know the God of the Old Testament, we see some pretty harsh things in there. But the theme we see throughout there is the love he has, the grace that he shows is amazing. And so if you act as a slave and you have this slave mentality and not an heir mentality, instead of being a son, you're a slave, then you have this false picture of God and who he is. And maybe he's more like that dad that's rough and tough and you're trying to make sure you don't t- tick him off, right? Unfortunately for me, I- I've learned over these years, I-, I don't know about you, I grew up in a time when that was life. Kids were to be seen and not heard. And that My goal was not to make my family angry, right? Like my job was not to make grandpa mad at me. That was kind of a thing. We all knew. Don't go in the house and upset papa, right? Don't be running around playing and laughing like kid stuff. No, that has to go outside. He's trying to watch TV or the Cowboys or something like that. Even when my son was little, I remember we'd try to brief him before we went in to see him. My grandfather, all right, (laughs) papa doesn't like kids screaming. I need you not to do that. And we were kind of on edge the whole time when we'd go in with our kids, like, watching them. Like, if they start to get crazy, let me get them out of the house so Papa doesn't lose his stuff. Even when my grandfather got much older and, and you know, some dementia and stuff had kicked in, you know, he was a little more comatose and calm. It was crazy. He'd let kids scream. He didn't really care. He was sitting on the porch one day, and it was 4th of July. We were popping firecrackers. And even in that state where he was just kind of just there, right? My son uh, lit up a firecracker and hit it by accident, and it fell and shot straight at my grandfather. (laughs) Hit him in his belly. He had a big belly. Uh, (laughs) And guess what? My my new calm grandfather that I never grew up with shot off that porch screaming and yelling. I was like, oh, there he is. That's the grandpa I grew up with that you better watch out. Luckily, it was short-lived. It was dark. He didn't know my son did it. (laughs) He calmed back down and sat down and enjoyed the evening. But the silly thing I'm saying is that there was this idea that I was growing up and that people understood, and maybe you grew up in that time too, that I better be on my best behavior. I don't want to make my dad mad. I don't want to make my grandpa mad. I, I, want to, I got to be a good enough boy for them so that they, they approve of me, right? Or, or honestly, just so they don't hurt me, right? My grandfather used to threaten to hang us up by a hook in the boathouse if we messed up. And listen... We believed it. There was no, like, he's not going to do that. 100% we believed it, right? There was no doubt in my mind. If I messed up, he was going to hang me up and leave me there. Not a doubt. Not a hesitation. I could threaten that to my kids, and they go, you're not going to do that. 
Yeah, I'm not. But we all thought they would. But that's not the picture. That's not what an heir is. That's not what God is. God's not just sitting there waiting for you to screw up and go, oh, you should have made me happy. That's not what he's doing. We are heirs to the throne. He loves us. See the difference between a slave and a son? See the difference between trying to win God's approval and acting out of approval? You don't have to do anything. I mean, I want you to work on your life because we're all sinners, so we need to work on our sinfulness and, and try to conquer the sin, the grip that it has on us because that keeps us from getting closer to God. But, but that's not a measure if you're a Christian or not. A Christian is you accepted Christ. You did it all by yourself. You didn't have someone hold your hand to do it. It wasn't because someone else in your family was this or always went to church. You made that decision. When you did that, you became an heir to the throne. You became a child of God. Look at verses 5 through 7 now. To redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoptions of the Son, and become, because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts. Now, I do want to point out right there, there's a movement right now for people to harp on, don't ask Jesus into your heart. I don't know about you, when I, when I grew up, that was kind of one of the things in churches. You need to ask Jesus into your heart, right? Well, guess what? It's biblical. Here it is right here. The, there's a lot of people in, in modern church worlds that are saying that that's not enough. You're, that's not what it's supposed to be. That quit. I mean, I know people have their whole sermon series titled, Quit Asking Jesus Into Your Heart, because they, they say, and they're not wrong. What they're trying to do is get people to say, it's not just that, though. You have to submit to him, surrender to him, and all that. But semantics, here it actually says do that. Anyways, that's a side point for you. You'll see them out there if you try to find them. And because you're a son's... God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. So here again, is Paul trying to get them to understand, you are not a slave, you are a son. Now, I don't know if you remember back in chapter 3, in verse 28, it's not going to be up there. We saw Paul say this, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's no male or female. So... Son, that's for all of us, male or female. All of us are heirs to the throne. All of us are sons or daughters or whatever else, right? But notice he says, Abba, Father. Any of you ever been taught about Abba, Father? Yeah? Anyone tell me what, right off the bat what you think it means? Daddy. Yeah, Daddy, Father. But in a loving way, not, you know, let me get on my knees before you, Lord Supreme Pontiff. No, Daddy. Let me yell at you. Any of you ever, when your kids were little, they said, mom or dad, a thousand times a minute? Mom, 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 dad, 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 dad. That's the picture here. Jesus is, is said, Abba, Father, Daddy. Matter of fact, he's, Paul writes it here, but I want to bring you back to where he said it. Look in, uh, where is it at? Hold on. Luke chapter 23. Luke 23, Jesus is on the cross famous series we did was about words from the cross, things Jesus said from the cross. Remember, that's where we got to tell us die. That's what it means when he said it's finished. So in Luke chapter 23, verse 46, then Jesus calling out with a loud voice said, Father, that Father there is Abba Father. That Father there is Daddy. It's this relationship with him that's not, oh, prim and proper, and I need to you know, be well-behaved. It's, it's my daddy. I'm, I'm, and I'm yelling out to my daddy, Daddy, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last breath. Jesus cried out to his daddy. Again, you may not have had a positive experience of dads in your life. I don't know. Like, I got a great stepdad now, but I didn't have one growing up. And so here he is showing them what Jesus did and what we are allowed to do. Abba, Father, because of this, you're no longer a slave, but a son. Jesus did that so we could be sons and daughters. He cries out to your father. And what I want you to understand, Jesus does this. Father, I trust you. In the worst day of my life, Daddy, 
I know you're here. And the most pain I've ever experienced in my life, I know you're here. Daddy, I'm here. For, I mean, I know you're here for me. I trust you. I surrender to you. This is going to be okay because you're in control. Isn't that what Jesus did on the cross? And all that pain and all that suffering, he cried out and said, Daddy, I give you my life. As sons and daughters, as heirs to the throne, that's what we're called to do. Salvation is surrendering and saying, Dad, I trust you. Dad, I, I trust you with everything. That's when you could be at your lowest low. You could be the most painful experience of your life. And in that moment, go, Father, <laughs> Daddy, I don't understand. I'm hurting. But I'm going to trust you. I'm going to lean into you right now. And it hurts. And it still hurts, Daddy, but I'm going to trust you right now. Paul was reminding them that's what it means to be a Christian, is that you are an heir to the throne. You need to stop adding to the gospel. Stop adding to this. You are a son and a daughter of the Most High, and he is there for you in the midst of whatever you're going through. I don't care I don't care how much you don't know. I don't care how lost you might think you are. I don't care how bad you think you are. I don't know where any of you are right now. You know that? When you meet somebody, we don't know. Just as I can't tell if you're a Christian or not, I also don't know what's going on in your life. The vast majority of you in here know me, and, and, and you can see that I'm maybe a little less excited today than I normally am. And you know why. But there's a handful of you in here that don't know why. I'm not going to tell you why. And I don't know what's happened in your lives. I don't know what you're struggling with at your house. I don't know what's going on between you and your wife or you and your kids or you and your boss. I don't know if you think life isn't worth living right now. I don't know if you're so bogged down with fear and hate you don't know what the next move would be. I don't know and you don't know. But here's what I know. Your daddy's there. And his arms are wide. He doesn't want you to try to be good enough or do some extra. He says, just surrender, accept me, and trust me. Anybody in here have trust issues? I've had some trust issues. <laughs> I mean, I've had chairs that I didn't trust, right? <laughs> that have fallen and break on me. I have trust issues with the Dallas Cowboys. They just look good, man, and then, mm, I'm an Aggie, so also, they look good and they're horrible, right? I have trust issues. Anybody ever been lied to? Anybody ever had a, a knife in your back? Gossip spread about you? Anybody had anybody just, you thought would never say that, but they did say that to you? Yeah. We all have. We've all been so hurt. And God is there ready. People will preach and tell you that, that he's there for you and, it, and it, he's there for you in the middle of all that pain. And, and the, the problem is he's there for you, but it doesn't necessarily go away, right? The pain's still there. The situation you're in is still there. The addiction's still there. The relationship that is broken is still broken. But he's there for you. He's your dad. You can cry out to him. That's where trusting in him comes or needs to happen. When I cried out to my daddy, when I cried out to my daddy, when it, when, it, when it hurts, when I'm crying, when I'm upset, when I, I, my heart, my soul is in pain, it doesn't mean that the pain just goes away. And I think a lot of us have experienced that and went, big deal, didn't work. That's not the point. What Paul is reminding them is the pain is going to be there one way or the other. But you have someone that cares about you. And it's going to take work, but you have to trust him. You may not understand it. You may not know how this fits into the grand scheme of things. But it's going to work out if you will trust him. Because one day, 
You're going to come into the kingdom. And you are going to be okay. One day, everything is going to be okay. One day, and it may not happen till heaven, but it's going to happen. One day, I'll get to see my son. One day, you'll get to see that loved one. One day, you'll see your mom or dad again. One day you'll see that friend again. One day you'll be in a place where there is no pain or suffering. That's because of what Jesus did. And your job, my job now, is to trust. Is God your master or your father? Are you a slave or are you a son? It's up to you. Who will you be today? Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to have you bow your heads, and I'm going to pray with you. We're going to sing a song together. I'm not going to take all this morning. Band can go ahead and come on up, guys. I want you to think about, first, am I a Christian? Did anything I say today, did you start thinking, oh, well, I did think I was a Christian because of what I grew up in or this or that. Well, hopefully you understand that's not the case. And so I do want to provide an opportunity for you to become a Christian. So eyes closed, heads bowed. If you'd like to become a Christian, I'll quote that same scripture. You confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. What has to happen is a confession of sin, a belief that God sent his son Jesus, died for you, and then a surrender, trusting him basically. So here, maybe some prayer like this. You say, God, I'm sorry for all my sins. I'm sorry for all the dumb things I've done. And I believe, God, you sent Jesus. And he died for me so that I could be a, 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 on the throne with you one day. I could be an heir, all that stuff. He, but, but he died for me. I surrender. To you. I trust you. I don't understand, but I trust you. I still closed. I know that there are people in this room living as slaves, not sons. You're trying to be good enough. You're trying to overcome things. You're like, I can do this. I can do that. You, you start misquoting scripture. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Yeah, that's not what it means. Today, you need to just stop and be a son. Today, you need to stop and cry out to Daddy. Eyes closed. How many of you today would be willing to say, I need my Daddy? I need my Daddy's help. I need to trust Him right now. If that's you, I want to pray over you now. Father, I pray. I pray that today... We realize we have a Father who loves us. A Father who will never forsake us. A Father who will never just throw us away to the garbage. A Father that will never beat you. A Father that will never guilt trip you. A Father that will be there for you no matter what. Daddy, we love you. Daddy, we trust you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're going to sing this song. And while we sing this song together, the bucket's going to go around. That's where I want to make sure you put your prayer request in there. The offering buckets. There's going to be people in the back that would love to pray with you. Maybe you need someone to talk to you about. Like when I first heard this, I had to go talk to the pastor and go, I want to know more about this dad, this father, because that's not what my dad looked like. Maybe you want to talk to somebody about that. There'll be people in the back to pray with you, to pray over with you. Let's stand, sing, pray, tithe, all that stuff.
sin runs deep. Where sin runs deep. Your grace is more. Where grace is found. Is where you before we go uh, not the first week first Monday of September but the second one I'm going to go ahead and start my Bible study on Monday night same time as the youth but we different right and my Bible study is, is going to be looking at things that we don't understand in the Bible answering questions that we don't quite get Frankie do you have that slide you may not I don't know anyway he, Frankie just fell off the chair we, we heard it <laughs> Don't worry about the slide, dude. Uh, here's what I need from you. What do you want to know about? Is, is there something that you've always struggled with? Like, hey, I don't understand. What does the Bible say about this? Or I was always taught it said this, but tell me, you said something different. What does the Bible say about immigration? Do you guys think you know what the Bible says about immigration? Do you think it's what Republicans say? No. Democrats say? Do you think that there's Republicans and Democrats in the Bible? Do you think America's in the Bible? There's a lot of topics out there that I want you to have the truth. I'm not going to tell you what you believe is right or wrong. All I'm going to do is point you to what the Bible says and say, you choose. So you can know what you believe, why you believe it. Not because Pastor Tommy said it, not because Oma or Opa said it, even if Oma Kathy said it. Because you read it in the Bible and you went, yep, that's what I believe, okay? And so I will need you to help me out. If you have things you want to know about, you need to get them to me. You can write them on these. You can give them to Beth. You can give them to me. I, I want to know. Now, it's not like I'm going to do an open mic night or something. All right, who's got a question? No, <laughs> I want to be prepared for you. But this is your chance. During that series, I don't know when we'll get to it, but we will start in Revelation too, because Revelation is one of those ones that everybody's confused about. Um, but you're not supposed to be. If anybody was here for that last one we did a couple years ago now, right off the bat it says you're supposed to be able to understand this. The point of Revelation is to understand it. And anybody can, I can promise you. I don't care how crazy it is, dragons and stuff like that, you can understand it. It wasn't meant to confuse you. So anyways, if you have some ideas, some things you want to know about, get those to me. I, I think I might stream Monday nights because I know a lot of people won't be able to come. Um, it's going to be a very casual Bible study. It's not going to be very rigid. I mean, not that we're <laughs> more casual than this. So anyways, be praying about that. Students, don't forget, not little people wherever he was. Students. <laughs> On three, I want you to shout to tell us die. One, two, three. <laughs> tell us die. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. Lord, I need you. Oh.